Let's talk about state and local government and how they're responding to the new cybersecurity initiatives. John Zanny gives insights. This is a bonus episode of The Business of Tech. John, tell me a little bit about what your role is at Acronis. Okay, so uh, I'm at Acronis SCS, and what, what we do, I run the company, and what we do is, is we specifically provide cyber protection services uh, to the U.S. public sector. So that's state and local government, federal government, nonprofit education, and uh, health care. So our job is to protect all those assets and data to make sure the bad actors don't get to it. Gotcha. Makes sense. So the the interesting reason that we wanted to talk today was was you were interested in talking a little bit about the different levels of engagement. When I talk a lot about cybersecurity on the show, I've been talking a lot about federal engagement. But you think that there's a lot more action at the SLED level, that state, local government, and education level. Tell me where, where why you think there's so much action at that level right now. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, and, and I appreciate you ask me, asking me that. So we all know the federal government is a target of attack from bad actors, especially certain uh, nation states. Uh, what a lot of these cities and states don't understand in small hospitals and even nonprofits is that because of the way the bad actors uh, go after these entities with ransomware, for example, or malware, or now what they call killware, uh, it's done in a programmatic way, which means there's really little cost for them to go after thousands or tens of thousands of entities. And as long as they uh, uh, succeed in a number of them, even if they don't get a lot of money per, per agent, agency or per group, it ends up being a significant source of revenue for them. And I use that term because they do run it like a business, right? They look at return on investment. And uh, the other advantage is that a lot of these cases, the infrastructure is not up to date. Uh, you might have a part-time IT person managing uh, that infrastructure for a local, a small city. And so they're just a prime target of getting thousands or tens of thousands of dollars over and over again, instead of trying to go for the big $10 million or $50 million payout. Well, they look a lot like small businesses, really, is what, what they end up looking like, right? It, it, exactly, uh, except for more complex, right? Because uh, you take the state of Arizona, for example, it's like it is a federated system. So some of the budgets, uh, city budgets, come from the state. Some of it uh, they have to supply themselves. Uh, school districts are the same. Uh, take a K to twelve school district. And uh, they have other items that they need to assign those budgets to, uh, for example, Omicron, right? Right. So when you're working with, with these, how much are you finding that these organizations try and do it themselves with like an internal IT department? And how much are they doing it with external contractors and vendors? Uh, it, it's a mix. It really just depends depends uh, who you talk to. And what I'm seeing is the the smaller the city or the smaller the entity, it seems like more that they just have a trusted IT provider that might be supporting multiple three to 5,000 uh, person cities or uh, uh, 50 doctor's offices, right? And, uh, and they don't understand that uh, there are tools out there that could help them be much more effective, especially through managed service providers that provide uh, full IT services that will help them be protected. Okay. So I want to get into a couple of specifics of things that we're seeing happen right now. There's been a lot of talk around certifications for cybersecurity solutions like FIPS you know, 140-2. As a, I'm a bit of a lay person on this one. When I read that, I go, well, that says federal in the name. How much of it is related to this space? What size providers and SLED need to be thinking about certifications like FIPS 140-2? Uh, so the, the way to think about it is uh, – when I was in the uh, early 90s, uh, before I was in tech, uh, go to buy a piece of technology for, for my home, whether it was a router or some software, you know, I would buy when it said, you know, certified for Windows. At that time, Windows was the big thing, because I knew if it had that stamp, it would just, 
it would work and it'd be easier to work. Well, this is the same thing. Uh, I don't uh, recommend anybody to go and get a uh, FIPS certified um, solution or get certified themselves because it's quite involved. It takes 18 to 24 months, a lot of money. But what they need to do is wherever they're getting their technology, their IT technology, whether it is storage, backup and recovery, uh, anti-ransomware, you need to ask them what certifications they have. If it is FIPS 140-2 certified, then it has government grade encryption, uh, both at rest and in transport. And so it allows you to feel good that someone's not just giving you a, a marketing spiel, but they actually got that certification. And it's not just FIPS, right? It's HIPAA, it's CGIS, uh, it's uh, NIST 800 171. Uh, we could take two hours if I went through every control there. But if you are NIST certified, uh, then you at least know that somebody audited the system and said, well, these guys are doing everything they can to make sure your data is protected. Okay. So I want to pick on one in particular because I want to get your take on it. And that's the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification or CMMC. Um, Correct. This is one where you know it's become a mandate you know, at some level, and and we're seeing more of that. But my again, my an analyst take on this is I keep seeing two sides to this. There's one side that says CMMC is a great framework and it's working really well to help give us some insights, and then I have other experts that are telling me, well, with 2.0, they've actually kind of neutered it a little bit. There's a lot more self-assessment to it. Uh, that it's a lot less helpful. How does – if I'm putting, standing in for the customer in a way with my level of, of analysis to it, how do I interpret this and how do you look at CMMC? So uh, just a little context in CMMC. Uh, it, it has five levels and I know they're, they're talking about changing it to three levels yeah. uh, depending on the level of cyber – of, uh, of uh, security you need to have where level one is just – basic basic security is similar to at your home i assume you lock your door at night and close your windows uh, before you go to bed then there's a, a, a another set of levels above that which is really for sensitive data but not cl uh, not classified or secret or top secret data and then there's the levels for data that just cannot get into bad actors uh, hands um, and what they did is they've actually done a pretty good job of separating the controls you need and what you need to do to protect uh, that data tied to its sen sensitivity. Unfortunately, with version 1.0, there were 171 controls in total over 17 domains, and it, it became cost prohibitive for a small business to become CMMC certified. On top of that, there were a small number of auditors, which means the prices were uh, ridiculously high, and uh, there were requirements that uh, just made it non-viable. So in comes 2.0, which is to try to get this compromise where if, if I'm a you know, three-person, five-person job, maybe even 20 people, that I can still meet the criteria uh, that allows the U.S. government to buy from me without having to essentially uh, invest millions of dollars for what could be, you know, a, a million dollar a year business or two million dollar a year business and getting access to that technology. Uh, so I think we have a few more years of finding that right balance, uh, and then that's why you're seeing this. But it, overall, the principle and what they want to accomplish, I think, is good and, and frankly, super important. Okay. So you, so you think that you your take on it is is that it's, that 2.0 is heading in the right direction in, tangentially? Co cor correct. It is. It might have overcompensated. The other part it doesn't do, uh, which uh, uh, we'll have to see how that plays out, is uh, one of the ways you could meet those, uh, those requirements is through partnering with other technology providers, right? So, for example, if you use a provider that already has FIPS 140-2 storage, since you brought up FIPS, uh, that meets a lot of the controls and the requirements and you don't have to go implement it yourself. Okay. Uh, there are cons there I see businesses coming up like virtual CIOs, right? So if you can't afford a few hundred thousand dollars a year for a CIO, uh, you can now use a service uh, that costs you much less that helps you provide that 
uh, those capabilities that you would need. Um, also, it depends what you supply, right? If you're supplying a little widget that does something uh, where the risk of it being an entry point for a bad actor is pretty low, that's just different than if you're providing some network protocol, right? Uh, which could be hacked. Gotcha. That, that makes some sense. So I've been talking a lot on the show about the infrastructure bill and the investments that uh, the, the federal government is making to try and beef up security. What are you seeing, as, since you, you work directly with a lot of the, the customers, what are you seeing as the impacts of that kind of short term now with some of that funding now that it's, it's, it's in play at least? What are you seeing as the impact? Correct. So the short term uh, is a recognition by the federal government that uh, SLED is super important and a, and, and a, a point of attack by the bad actor, right? The, the bill des, uh, designates over a billion dollars over the next four years to state, local, tribal, and territorial uh entities, right? Another $250 million for uh, rural uh, areas. That's absolutely fantastic. It's money that's there for those guys to really update their systems, hire some people to put in place the automation so that they can uh, be protected. Uh, the challenge with the bill, when I talk to some of these uh, smaller cities or entities, is they have no idea how to get the money, okay. right? Uh, so what's not clear yet is what do I need to do to actually qualify for that grant that I don't go and put in all this infrastructure and protect myself? And then the federal government says, oops, you didn't do this one thing. And so we're not going to give you any money. Right. So there's work there to do. And we, we saw this with uh, with COVID, right, and the grants around COVID, where there was money left on the table because people just didn't know how to go after it. The small business bill, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so that that's where the work lies, is how do you get access to that money? And then uh, once you do, then you find some IT providers that can help you really protect yourself. Gotcha. Or I could also say that this is an opportunity for the IT providers to dig in and figure that out and help customers navigate it, right? With uh, cor correct. Yes, that, it's a, a sorry to interrupt you, but a very, very fair point. It's just difficult, uh, even for us as an IT provider. I'd love to have a blog that says, "Here are the ten steps you need to do to get your fair share of the money." Uh, it's just not very well defined, and you know, uh, for better or for worse, uh, we're in a country where if I make promises and then they don't get the money, I could get sued for owing them. Uh, that money, right? So you have to navigate carefully, so what are, but it's there. Yeah, so what are, you, what are we looking for then in terms of guideposts or direction to help navigate that? Particularly if we think, I always cite the fact that, you know, around 90% or more of, of all provider, IT services providers are less than $5 million in revenue. This seems like a great area to be looking at, but now we've just sort of warned it's hard. How do they start looking at navigating this? So my, my experience in dealing with uh, these uh, SLED entities is they, most all of them already have their trusted vendors, right, and IT providers. And they and if they need to be on certain programs, they're already on the program. So if I was one of those vendors or IT providers, I'd go to my customer and say, look, there's this money here. Let's work together to figure out how to go get it. And I know it's not a silver bullet, it's not uh, uh, magical, but it's what you need to do and say, look, I can build out a program or a solution for you that'll be within the constraints of the cost, uh, but we need to work together to figure out what you need to do to actually get those funds and when you would get it. And then uh, it's about navigating the system. Right, and it takes time, but the ones who put in the effort will get access to amazing amount of funding, right, and really be uh, uh, protected. Well, if it, if, ever, if it was easy and everyone was doing it, it'd be a commodity, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so we don't like commodity uh, businesses; we like hard businesses. Right, but the, the good news is the technology is there. It's really just about getting the funding. Okay, got it. So I want to want to get the last sort of question area I wanted to go on with you is, is I want a little bit of predictions from you. So so I'm trying to get a feel of for, from various experts on their take on the landscape. If I go at a really, really high level, you know, you've got groups like, like the big analysts that are saying, you know, a G20 nation is going to respond to a cyber incident in a physical way by 2024. <laughs> like, so for me, that points to like, this problem is going to get worse, security in general, almost before it gets better. 
What's your take on the security landscape? Are we going to get better this year? Is it going to get, continue to get worse? More of the same? What's your, what's your take? <laughs> uh, I, I think it will get worse and better at the same time. And what I mean by that is uh, you have to understand um, – Advanced technology has really been commoditized. Uh, you can go to Microsoft Azure or uh, Amazon AWS and, and get access to AI technology compute services, which you could not, an individual could not do in the past. So the bad actors attacking uh, these systems have access, uh, easy, low cost access to pretty advanced technology, uh, which means that it's going to get worse. At the same time, uh, there are more and more sophisticated tools like ours, and, and we're not the only one in the market, uh, that can combat uh, these bad actors. And now through the infrastructure bill, we see there's funding from the government to help protect yourself. So I think what you're going to see is those that really are proactive to protecting themselves, it'll get better. Those who think they can wait another year or two are going to find themselves attacked and uh, having, you know, worst case scenario to pay a lot of money, best case scenario be down for days or weeks at a time, which, you know, lost in productivity is still lost, lost in money, right? Right. So it's interesting to me that you said, said that, and I, I'm going to follow up there, there is, is the worst case scenario is downtime. Uh, do you think that there's reputational damage or, or not where it comes to these breaches now? Or are they so commonplace that it just doesn't matter anymore? Oh, absolutely. There's reputational damage. What you don't see, uh, unless you're really paying attention, and in many cases, uh, there are, uh, let's just say, employees in the technology sector that disappear after there's been a breach. Uh, um, I don't know. Uh, it's sort of weird. Being attacked and telling people about it is sort of like getting one of those embarrassing diseases that you just don't want anybody to know and you want it to go away. And and so what happens is that they, of course, you know, spend a lot of money getting a forensics team to come bring them back up. A lot of people don't realize that it's not like even if you pay the ransom, you're up an hour later. Uh, bringing systems back online is hard and complex. And then uh, they'll... Or the leadership will change the organization because someone screwed up, but they won't talk about it because uh, they're embarrassed. Uh, and there is legislation, by the way, going through uh, government, both federal and some states, uh, to force reporting mm -hmm. so that this problem, uh, uh, there's more, there'll be more awareness around this problem and even more funding, which I expect. Gotcha. Well, that's a good series of predictions to end on. John, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of The Business of Tech. If you like it, hit the like button and hit that red subscribe button. It really does make a difference, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I'm doing. You want to discuss more? Want to find out more about the interview? Go ahead and put something in the comments. I read them all, and I look forward to the ongoing discussion. If you want to get content like this every single day, the five-minute Business of Tech podcast is available wherever fine podcasts are found. Go to businessof.tech, click the blue subscribe button. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Additionally, if you want to help me with the content that I create, you can support me directly. Go to patreon.com slash MSP radio and click the button there. You choose what the content is worth and get access to these interviews and discussion episodes early. They come out for my Patreons and Patreons drive the discussion and ask questions directly. Looking forward to ongoing conversations and thanks for watching. Thank you.